My name is Leon Bolivar. I am the Global Library Marketing Manager for Springer. Thank you for coming to the event. Uh, very important, I think, as Boris mentioned, is that we want this to be interactive. We want you guys to be engaged. We want to hear from you. Let's not make it a stuffy, boring type of event. Let's have fun with it. Let's engage, let's talk, ask questions, butt in. But the more comfortable you are, the better the event will be overall. What is scarce now is not information, but time and attention. Now, I firmly believe that our future is wrapped up in how well we innovate our services, primarily through collaborating with our customers. So the first skill of an innovator is questioning. Now, Peter Drucker, the famous management thought leader, said, the important and difficult job is never to find the right answers, but to find the right question. Questioning often reveals sacred cows and entrenched traditions that are holding us back from improving ways of serving our customers or streamlining our office operations. A couple years ago, the library was really trying to look at where should we be going in the future at, at the NIH library. And uh, we basically brought everybody into the room and said, you know, what do you see happening in five years? And we listed the opportunities that were out there. Then we also listed things that could be holding us back from doing those things. And we really tried collaboratively and, and um, as, a, as an entire organization, not just you know, management on high bringing down tablets, but, but everybody jointly working together to see where do we think things are going. Because you know, the, the, the people that work in document delivery, the people that work at the reference desk, they have different perspectives of where, what our customers need and where they're going. So I encourage that idea of, of questioning and, and creating an environment where you can openly question. The second skill of Innovator's DNA is observing. By observing and studying our customers and other organizations around us, we can learn many valuable lessons and change our services for the better. Participating in library conferences, for example, scientific conferences that your customers participate in, uh, reading articles and posts from a wide range of sources can all help you to monitor this rapidly changing information industry. Most of all, we can't work in isolation. The third skill of an innovator is a willingness to experiment. And talking to a government audience, this is probably one of the hardest to do. Now, Thomas Edison said, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> Experimenting, which is risky, is a critical trait of an innovative person. The innovative companies didn't stop because their ideas sounded crazy to conventional wisdom. So the final skill of the innovator's DNA pulls together those four actions, the questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. The mental connections are the spark of innovation and have spawned new business processes and changed the world. So this is ultimately a personal exercise, learning from others who have made those unconventional associations to create new services for our customers will help and encourage us to do likewise. Building a culture that allows us and encourages these innovative traits at the manager level and at the employee level will challenge traditional leadership and traditional librarianship, but it will result in a more relevant and innovative organization. The trends that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation can be summed up as a shift away from collections and towards services. The traditional library as a place is becoming irrelevant to discussions about the future. And I think it's already happening based upon the statistics that I've already shown you. Our future is in service. And how we use that space in new ways to better serve our customers. Great service is built upon a clear understanding of our customer needs. So that questioning and observing trait. And also delivering it and in some cases in advance of them knowing that they need it. But to me, that's the experimenting, networking, and associating traits. Increasingly, service will involve risk because we're moving from delivery to the in of information to distillation of that data into information and into answers. And in order to remain relevant in the future, we have to move from a warehouse mentality to one that enables our customers to do their research better and faster. My topic is discoverability. 
Uh, and uh, I talked a little bit about this at ALA, and I want to talk about it again today. Uh, this is a quote by Rick Lug and Ruth Fisher. You may have, uh, you may know them. Uh, they're, they're former YBP people up in Conococke, New Hampshire, and they've done some really excellent work, I think, in helping libraries. I, I admire their work. Uh, and they said in an against the grain uh, a little bio, collection development will continue to evolve toward curation of a discovery environment. And when I read curation of a discovery environment, it kind of set me on the course that I've been on for the last um, <clears throat> several several months, uh, maybe better part of a year, uh, working in um, what we call discovery reviews, analyzing closely library websites, analyzing closely the findability of, of Springer content uh, through various means, through all, all, all the means that you make available to your users. Uh, so it is kind of my job to understand uh, what you've done to make content available and to, and to kind of reflect that back to you and then, and then work on that with you. Uh, I want to tell you all about what Springer has to do to make the discovery infrastructure work. Uh, we have to do our part. Uh, the intermediaries in the discovery layer have to do their part. And it, it's extraordinary to me that the one kind of very strong bond, I think, that, that a publisher has with a library is our mutual dependence on the, the middle layer of discovery infrastructure that, that is going to make or break this online content, I think, to a large extent. Some of it's under our control and some of it's not, but I want to tell you about what the parts of it that are under Springer's control, what we do. Springer Link total usage 2,833 million, moves up next year 165 million. This is ebooks and journals, by the way, this is together move up in 2010, 187 million downloads, all counter stats. Uh, last full year of stats, 208 million uh, downloads. Okay, 208 million downloads uh, a year and obviously moving up every year. Um, it, this is something that, that is, is, is a serious amount of, of traffic that we have to pay attention to on any given day. We're a top 900 to 1,000 website in the world uh, and um, you can see that uh, we've gone up 13% in the six month period, uh, the first half of 2011, first half of 2012 comparison. This is important because our mark records that we create, and we have Miriam Kessler, who's a librarian from the National Library in Germany, um, working very hard on this to make these records proper. Um, they seed the mark records for everybody else. So if the good things that we do at the start make it that much easier down the road um, for mark records and um, we want to do, we want to get this right. I mean this is important. This is phase three of our project. I think it's the most important because we're going to add complete table of contents for all our ebooks, not just going forward but retrofitting it back to 2005. For that reason if you've loaded our mark records already you know, you might consider eventually when this is all out, hopefully September, uh, some type of overlay project to add in all those extra access points. Everything I've said here and anything else you want to know about MARC records or if you want to download our MARC records or go to the OCLC connection where you get the free OCLC WorldCat, you know, <laughs> collection set records for our ebooks, all that stuff, you can find the links to it and other things at springer.com slash MARC. We have Excel spreadsheets. Um, if you go to springer.com slash mark and click on the, you know, download the stuff, you can get a list of our ebooks any day you want. Pick the subject, pick the year, pick the format, just say I want a list, you know, it comes out in an Excel spreadsheet. You can get a list of our ebooks anytime you want. Um, and we have content management metadata staff. We didn't have metadata staff, you know, six years ago. We didn't, when we first came out with ebooks, I'm going to be honest, I don't think we were. Some, some of our company wasn't all that clear of the importance of MARC records when it came to ebooks. And they found out really quickly the importance of MARC records. In fact, it's, it's the bulk of the product is the MARC record. So we, we figured that out, we refined it, we've gotten better, and now we have a whole, you know, teams of people working on this to make it better and better. So discovery reviews with libraries, this is what I've kind of um, engineered um, and, and, and kind of introduced to, to Springer. Um, you know, basically what we do is we, we look to see for you, we follow your usage every quarter. Um, if your usage happens to trend down, God forbid, but if it does, we, we find that out right away 
And uh, we know you have lots of publishers and database usage to keep track of. You can't be on top of necessarily Springer use every quarter, unless maybe you're really good and you do. But we keep track of it too. Um, and if something goes wrong, we need to jump in. We call it triage. And uh, we, the first thing we do is we take a look, um, we, whether we're doing books or journals, depending on the situation, we conduct a review. What we want to see is, are there any obstacles? for your users getting to our content? Is there any things that we can spot that maybe could be a little bit better? Um, we verify first to make sure that your access is good. Is something wrong with the access? We have to fix that right away. But once it's, we, we realize that that's okay, um, then we start checking your library site. We check you know, increasing levels of, of detail to see how, how far down into the content your, your, you know, your, your search box goes um, and, and various search boxes that you might have. So, I mentioned Springer.com at your library. This is just a pitch for account development and the specialty area of field service that Springer is engaged in. So, you know that we're out there, you know, working in kind of in the trenches with you in some ways, really lurking on your website is what we're doing. But um, uh, we're still out there evaluating. Um, and, and we put everything we know uh, about uh, our own products and about things that might help you. Um, learn about uh, new things uh, with our products. Uh, we put it all on Springer.com at your library. And there's going to be more there. We're going to be adding more white papers, white papers that could be, I think, of real interest to you coming up. Um, so it's, it's uh, something that we will probably mention. Uh, in future, you'll hear us talking a lot about it. Um, a little bit more on account development. I said counter usage. We're tracking on a quarterly basis for you. Um, we conduct account reviews. Um, that go beyond counter data. We look into exactly what subjects and exactly what kinds of content are being used by your group, what percentage of portfolio is being used, all those kinds of things that you might not have time to do yourself. We just come and give you a quick demo of what it is so you know what's being used on Springer. LibGuides. And we create virtual libraries. So um, the Energy Bureau has one, the um, uh, Intelligence and Research. So we work with those departments to set up these little electronic libraries that link to products and titles that they would be interested in. Um, we've recently started this little mobile library link. So basically, for our products that render well on a BlackBerry, um, we have links to those. And we've set up a, a, a little site for that. We do use Ex Libris Primo, which we call Full Search. Um, we implemented that a little over a year ago. Um, and we have been in the process of turning on all the metadata we can. Um, our theory being, if, if people can find it, even if we don't own it, we can get it for them. And usage stats have been going up just in the few months we've been using it. Um, we also recently turned on or got access to SFX and turned on links to Google Scholar. Um, and that was kind of a surprise. Um, we kind of did it as a whim. Oh, look, we can do this. Oh, yeah, we can do that. And immediately had people going, that's so cool. So we didn't, you know, weren't aware our people were going to Google, Google Scholar, and I have no idea how they were getting things. Um, but now they're getting links to the library. So it's actually driving more people to our data, which is great. Um, we do know that people go directly to the vendor sites because we all the time, the, the ones that are branded, so they'll find some journal article that we don't subscribe to. So they'll have been at some other thing that we do, they'll go to another one. It still says, you know, Department of State Bunch Library in the corner. And they'll call me and say, how come I get access to this but not that? And I'll say, well, we don't subscribe to that one. You know, we can get it for you. Um, but we, it's useful because I figure someone bothers calling me asking for a title. We put that on our list to add if we get more money. There was no way that our library, a print library, could ramp up so quickly and include things in sciences and social sciences and all that. So we turned to ebooks. So when we planned our online library, it seems quaint now, but we tried to mirror a print library. So we tried to put in all of the major encyclopedias. We, we basically divided into three products reference works, ebooks, and journals. In, in essence, what we tried to do is mirror completely the research library we had in print. I thought I'd start with a Springer ebook on behalf of Springer since they're sponsoring this event. Um, the one I happen to pick just happens to be environmental chemistry. Um, 
the thing that we like about it and makes it perhaps a little bit different in terms of interface is the download PDF right here. So a lot of people do, as you well know, download those PDFs. Some ebook publishers do not make it that simple or make it that visible. So we do appreciate Springer doing both. But in essence, what we had hoped to do is to be able to use this as a vehicle for getting our ebooks in particular out to a broader audience. We had always wanted to do two things. We wanted to be able to combine the journal content with the book content. We wanted our researchers to see it all at once and then be able to pick. This was the first time we'd ever been able to make that happen. Tablets and smartphones, they're here. They're already in the hands of our managers and our users. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, in my organization, the, um, it's slowly but surely disseminating out. Um, uh, I know that my director sends email that says sent from my iPad. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly how she understands the relationship of that device to everything that's available to her on our internal networks through our licensed capabilities, et cetera. But there's no question that these things are in their hands. They probably have them at home. They definitely are looking at these as an integrative device, not as a disruptive device in the way that they're working. So, so we, we start from a benchmark of knowing that these things are out there. They are growing. Um, and, and the question really is, are we going to be there with our users or are we going to be behind them trying to catch up? Something that is emerging that, uh, that I think we all are, are on the cusp of understanding is this idea of patron-driven acquisitions or patron-driven access. Um, Brad talked about how um, he doesn't turn anything off, <laughs> but he only writes the check when they've clicked on and, and, and gone through to it. That is a model you might find very, very risky, <laughs> but it is a model that I argue we need to start looking at, especially on the fringes of the domains that we work in. Um, you know, where is it that you are currently denying your patrons access that could actually open up understanding within the research area that you focus on? So um, the future of document delivery is seamless to our users. Um, we've done a lot to license things, but the reality is there are certain things that we don't, can't anticipate that they're going to need. How disruptive do we need to be in that interaction? And are there models for access and for purchase that could allow us to serve them better moving forward? And I argue that we need to be the data miners. We need to be uncovering the value of the information that we provide. So it's not enough for you to buy a Springer eBook collection on a subject area. It's important for you to then carry that information out to the potential user community and say, hey guys, we just expanded access in this realm. Uh, you know, go check out these eBooks. You know, um, I don't know about you, but most of my users do not come into a location with a library on a regular basis. So it's not about saying, yo, we're here. It's about making sure that we are where they are and that we are integrated into the work that, they do, that we do. I think it's great if you're able to hold speaker series or if you're able to engage people that, that walk through or that use your rare book room as a meeting room, but, but you also need to be thinking about webinars, about attending their conferences and meeting with them where they go so that they understand that you're a part of their work instead of them being a part of yours. I said, you know, what we're scared to death about is you're going to start interlibrary loaning the whole ebook and then it's out of control and we, we don't want to put DRM on things, but sending the whole, e, you know, EPUB is the whole book as opposed to the PDFs, which most people, if you loan part of it, you're going to loan a chapter, probably a PDF. Um, they said, look, you know, if you, if you offer us both the EPUB format and the PDF chapters, we'll we'd be willing to use the PDF to loan occasional chapters to, to people who needed it and you could restrict us to not loaning the EPUB. Is that a restriction that you would accept as well or not? I don't think that there's a real risk that library to library that we're going to be holding on to these things and, and making new, new uses or purposes for them. And also I think that our purpose in meeting our individual users needs is supporting the EPUB for their devices, but that we understand a restriction in exchange, exchanging information that, that what we would share in your library loan would be a, a PDF 
of, of the selected content that's required. And where do you folks get inspired by? Like, what, what, what blogs do you go to? What websites do you go to? Where do you find this information that, uh, that kind of lights this light bulb up top of your head? I follow a, a bunch of great people on Twitter that are always bringing resources out and saying, hey, I just read this, you know, the Pew Internet Trust sends something out, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's a light with, with, with the summary of their activities. So, so I, I simply make sure I read my Twitter feed every, uh, every couple of days because, you know, else I miss something. So, but, um, but so I'm not following specific sources. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a go-to guru, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of people that are looking at a bunch of different sources no one place just like Richard said and I think it may be because maybe the industry as we know it I mean the digital revolution is still so young I think maybe there are still not a lot of lessons learned out there we're just beginning to compile them now so I think we each have to be our own guiding light to some degree first of all I just want to thank everybody for coming um, I, I think this was uh, a great event uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it as much as I did but I did want to inform you of what's going on at Springer and some of the new innovative uh, things that we're doing. So this is the Springer Link website, as many of you know, um, as you can see. Very, um, you know, Yahoo-esque uh, website, a lot of content, a lot of places that you can click through. Um, and this is the new site. Trying our best to simplify it, you know, being publishers and having so much content available, you can't go completely Google. Right, you can't completely take everything off. But we're trying to simplify it as much as possible. Simple uh, browsing area on the left-hand side, simple search box on top. And the nice thing about this is that it's mobile accessible. Meaning, as soon as you start you know, minimizing the screen, as soon as you put it on an iPad, as soon as you link it to an iPod, it's gonna look just like this, except for smaller. The place where we're going is mobile accessibility. So instead of the application, all of our other content, including Springerlink, is going to be available on the mobile sites themselves. Um, so you can still go to springerlink.com, um, Springer Protocol, Springer Materials, all those sites you can go to on your mobile device, whether it's iPad, iPod, um, Android, uh, which is something that we don't have an application for, uh, Blackberries, etc. And those sites are going to be mobile accessible. In other words, it's going to look just like the regular website, just like the regular Springer link, just like the regular databases, except it's going to be a lot more accessible to you. Um, you know, the text is going to be smaller. But you can do the same functionality as you could do with the full site, searching, um, browsing, etc. And that's it.